Welcome to the Diaspora Today Show. My name Abdul Rashid Abu Bakr. We are live in Washington, D.C. at the Averizon Bank Dr. Babaka in the annual lecture series. He did what he knew was right. He paid the price many times over. Dr. Babaka Ndiaye was the former president African Development Bank between 1985 to 1995. Dr. Babaka Ndiaye was a religious man who knew the Quran as well as the Old Testament, the New and the New Testament and understood that we are all one. Let us listen to what the speakers have to say about the late Dr. Babaka Ndiaye, the former president, African Development Bank. Happy watching. was the fifth president of the African Development Bank during 1985 to 1995, during which he spearheaded the establishment of the African Export Import Bank in 1993. Dr. Bakande was a visionary, consummate leader, and a great institution builder who served the continent of Africa in an exemplary way throughout his well-documented and celebrated career. The fact that so many of us are here today, despite our very busy schedules, is a testament to our love for this great man. Each generation must discover its mission, fulfill, fulfill it, or betray it in relative capacity. This insightful quote from Franz Fanon, the author of Richard of the Earth, epitomizes the life and times of Dr. Ndiaye. Early in his life, he discovered his mission and helped in steering his generation towards that mission. He did not only realize quite early that political independence was meaningless without economic power, he devoted his whole life to ensuring that Africa also gained economic independence. He saw that being independent without being economically independent was useless. He used every opportunity of leadership to serve Africa towards achieving the goal of economic independence. Born during the colonial era in 1936, in Guinea Conakry, Babaka Ndeye built a career in finance founded on his acclaimed superior intellect, hard work, and determination. He realized early that finance was key to economic progress. So he chose to pursue a career in development finance and reached the pinnacle of that career when he became the president of the African Development Bank in 1985. As president, he did not sit on his palms and watch times pass by. Indeed, he sought to use that opportunity to make an impact on his people. Dr. Ndiaye engineered a massive 
transformation of the African Development Bank and the financial landscape of our continent, Africa. He oversaw the quadrupling of the equity capital of the ADB to enhance its operations and development impact. He secured a triple A rating for the ADB, the first ever for an African entity, even today. He strategically used the African Development Bank's platform and convening power to address some of the key constraints to economic development facing Africa. And in that process, he emerged as a prodigious builder of institutions in, across Africa. Most notably, to address the consequences of the global financial crisis of the 1980s on our continent, to reduce our continent's dependence on commodities, to expand intra-African trade and improve Africa's trade competitiveness. Dr. Babakande championed the establishment of the African Export-Import Bank in 1993, tactically mobilizing support from African governments and the private sector. He also attracted international investors at a time Afro-pessimism was at its highest. President Diaye was also instrumental in the creation of Shelter Africa and the African Business Roundtable, two important institutions that are positively impacting Africa today. Babaka worked tirelessly to design and build Africa's financial architecture as we know it today. He not only built multilateral financial institutions, he strongly supported the growth of the African private sector at a time when the private sector was at best rudimentary in the continent. Some of these may sound ordinary today, but in the 1980s, when he initiated them, they were revolutionary. Dr. Ndiaye created the new normal we all cherish today and take as ordinary. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, to give this first uh, lecture in memory of Dr. Ndiaye. Um, and let me uh, commend the president of the bank for uh, his excellent uh, uh, exposition of a tribute uh, to Dr. Nadia. There, there were three things in his talk I thought that I, I uh, that resonated uh, especially. Uh, the first remark that he made was that political independence was meaningless without economic independence. And that was something that I felt very strongly from my first visit to Africa almost 50 years ago. Um, the second one is that successful development requires finance. Uh, and it requires constructive uh, finance. We all know about uh, the problems in Wall Street. That's destructive finance. But uh, the kind of finance that one needs to create new enterprises uh, in the way that was just described is an example of constructive finance. And it was particularly important, and that's the third thing, to have institutions that can support this kind of finance that were African institutions. Um, the contribution he made to the Africa uh, Development Bank and uh, and particularly in creating uh, this new African Export-Import Bank. Let me say that uh, while he describes some of the difficulties 
I don't think he fully articulated how, how difficult it was at that particular time. Because this, just to remind you, this was the period of the dominance of the Washington Consensus where the view was that development banks in general and government-owned banks in any form were an anathema. They were going to be corrupt, they wouldn't work, and uh, creating a new development institution, a new development bank in that context of uh, that sort of hostile intellectual atmosphere was a real uh, achievement. I know a little bit about how difficult it is because I, I was involved in creating, uh, helping create the new development bank uh, just a couple of years ago. And uh, it didn't take six years, but it took uh, almost that long uh, to shepherd that process uh, through. And uh, the reason that, that I got involved with uh, Nick Stern and, and, and one of the uh, um, uh, leading people behind it was the uh, premier of Ethiopia uh, as an instigator of this particular project of the importance of finance for development and today including for climate finance and for uh, the economic transformation that uh, Africa will be going through. So I really did welcome this invitation to give, to give, this, uh, to give this talk. Uh, and it's again a pleasure. I, I had the, the uh, uh, pleasure to, to be with uh, the African uh, Export Import Bank uh, at its annual meetings in Seychelles about a year and a half ago. And uh, it was a, a, a fantastic meeting. Uh, uh, if you have a chance to go to one of their annual meetings, you should go. Uh, it was uh, a, a, a real uh, exciting interchange. Um, and uh, a, a very different in spirit from some of the more stuffy meetings that you may be participating uh, here. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so I, I really, really uh, did enjoy it. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is what I see as a, a, the inclusive development strategy for Africa for the 21st century. Your Excellencies, uh, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've, um, we're here uh, celebrating the life of a, a son of Africa who, whose accomplishments, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Rama uh, talked a bit about uh, some of them, uh, who has touched so many lives on the continent through his work. Uh, a few weeks ago at the, first let me say, um, the African Development Bank is, uh, that I represent here uh, this evening uh, is uh, very happy to be associated with this inaugural um, launch uh, of the, of the Babanka India uh, Lecture Series. Now a few weeks ago at the African Development Bank, uh, we also honored the legacy of Dr. Ndiaye, President Ndiaye. And uh, at the end of the ceremony, the, the main auditorium of the African Development Bank was named after Dr. Bapika Ndiaye, just to, to etch. <laughs> to really make that point that his legacy remains forever his contribution to, you, you cannot write the story of the African Development Bank or even tell the story of Africa's development without mentioning Dr. Babaka Ngiya. Now, I, I point to something physical, his name, basically that is on the main auditorium of the African Development Bank headquarters, uh, in the headquarters building. But more importantly is the impact of his work, uh, as I said, on the young uh, the girl in Malawi that who's the course of her life would have changed perhaps completely had it not been for the vision of uh, Dr. Babaka Ndiaye to perhaps the work he did, he did let's say, in education or in health in another country 
some of the roads that he, he built, the bridges, the dams, etc., and the, the list goes on. And through this work, many lives have been changed. But just as importantly, as we look forward, it's, it's also the lecture series that has just been launched. And Professor Stiglitz, uh, you talked about the knowledge gap as one of the key factors uh, that makes it the difference, that explains the difference between countries that are rich and successful and those that are trying to be rich and successful. <laughs> I see this lecture series as one of the, again, continuing that legacy and ensuring that the work of Dr. Babuka and the continues forever, that it continues to change lives, continues to uh, bring hope to those that have lost hope, uh, bring uh, improved nutrition levels, uh, get people education, etc. And so this is such an important step in essentially making that continuing contribution in the name of a true Pan-Africanist, a true son uh, of Africa. And in that regard, I know the family is here, and we also, of course, uh, thank them sincerely for sharing this wonderful man with the continent. Welcome to the Diaspora Today Show. My name is Abdul Rashid Abu Bakr. We are still at the Dr. Babakar Ndiaye Annual Lecture Series sponsored by the African Export and Import Bank. I'm, I'm right here with the President of African Export and Import Bank, Dr. Benedict Orama. Dr. Benedict, welcome to the show today. Thank you very much. How are you, sir? Thank you. Yes. Um, you lay a lot of emphasis on the diaspora. How can Africans in the diaspora help to boost the workforce, to help your vision for the Africans in the diaspora? No, for us, uh, the Afri Africans in the diaspora represent an economy. Uh, there is no need, in fact, it's not helpful to look at them as an amorphous group. They represent an economy. Our estimates show that their economic size alone uh, is the highest if they were to be considered a country. Indeed, in our strategy in our Fraction Bank, we regard them as the 56th African state. The diaspora um, remits $63 billion every year to Africa they save about $53 billion. The import goods estimated at about $50 billion. The diaspora has tremendous store of skills, knowledge, and experience. Uh, and some of the changes we're beginning to see in uh, Africa uh, uh, derive largely from the influence of the diaspora. If you look at the movie industry in Nigeria, uh, uh, the growth we've seen there has a lot to do with the inputs for the diaspora. So for us, our target is to leverage this as an opportunity. And leveraging it as an opportunity means 
that we have to design specific interventions, financial and advisory interventions, uh, to make it possible for Africans in Africa, the geography space called Africa, to deal and trade more with Africans in the diaspora. Because our focus on this program is to see how young entrepreneurs in the diaspora can come back home and do business. That so, is. how can your institution leverage that power to bring those young generation back home to do business? Uh, there are two things that we do with the, with the Africans in the, the, with the diaspora. It's not everybody in the diaspora that uh, is a, be a business person. So, but there are businesses in Africa that require skills on the Africans in the diaspora. So that is one aspect, and that is happening, and we are promoting that. Uh, as a matter of fact, we hire quite a few people for the diaspora, even in our own bank. And when we have companies that where we feel that the skills are needed, we encourage them to look out for people in diaspora, because the experiences are necessary. Uh, you heard Professor Stiglitz saying it today, the knowledge gained, you cannot take it away. Uh, then the second one are the business people actually. And what we are doing is that we have an advisory services that is able to identify opportunities for them in various parts of Africa. And also then introduce them to those opportunities and finance those businesses. We provide funding for businesses, even in the countries of, uh, uh, of domicile of the diaspora, to the extent that that business will have links with Africa. So we have available project finance to enable them to come back home and set up their businesses. We have trade finance to make them trade uh, back, to back, back to Africa. And we also do another thing we try to create training services, whereby we have Africans who want to do business, who have identified opportunities, but they don't have uh, um, the certificate of managerial skills and all that. And then we have some diaspora businesses who are already doing something similar, but we try to connect, connect them and they form joint ventures. What is the lesson to be learned from Dr. Babaka in the eye? Well, uh, Dr. Bakan uh, is a man whose life teaches us a number of things. He teaches us that for you to be a good leader, that to be impactful, you have to, have to be courageous. You have to have perseverance. You have to be visionary. And if you're an African, you have to be passionate for Africa. What is your message to the world? The message to the world, especially to young Africans, is to make sure that they imbibe these good values that Bakandiaye actually demonstrated. Because just by studying and, uh, and uh, learning about the life and times of Bakandiaye would tell you what such qualities can do to a continent that so much needs development. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Benedict. I really appreciate you joining me on the show today. Professor Joseph uh, Stiglitz, uh, can you please tell us how do you see the Africans in the diaspora contributing to the African economy moving forward? Well, I think there are two ways they can obviously contribute. Uh, uh, Remittances of money <laughs> obviously help. Uh, uh, investments in Africa help. And then there are what are sometimes described as cultural remittances. That is to say, the spread of ideas, uh, what you've learned uh, for good and for bad, uh, but the lessons, sharing the lessons of uh, uh, life and uh other country. You, you lay em more emphasis on the government policies during uh, your, uh, your speech. How do you think that will affect the economic development of African nations? The countries that are going to be successful are those countries where the state takes on what we call the role of the development state, uh, where they uh, help 
provide a framework, not do everything, but provide a framework for the country, uh, that provide finance to help small businesses start, that provide education so that people can live up to their potential. Uh, that uh, provide basic infrastructure so that uh, the country uh, can develop. Uh, I think Africa is uh, a country, a uh, land, a subcontinent with uh, a continent with uh, enormous challenges but enormous opportunities. Uh, and uh, it's people who've grown up in Africa who understand both the challenges and the opportunities, and that's where young African entrepreneurs can play a real role. Uh, they know the needs, uh, they know the constraints, they know the possibilities, and so uh, it's, uh, the challenge for them is to, to meet these enormous needs and using their, their talents to help uh, Africa grow. Thank you for watching the Diaspora Today Show. I will see you next time. Bye for now.